It's really obvious then that Hubble engaged himself in the most extraordinary denial of fact in all the history of science in his attempt to get rid of the center and demand the universe be everywhere the same. How did Hubble and all astronomers since then evade it? This they did by adopting a new untested assumption about redshift called space-time expansion. As this illustration shows, space-time expansion assumedly causes light to be redshifted as it travels across the universe, independent of the Doppler effect. This idea was adopted over 70 years ago, but remained untested until David and I did so and found proof it has always been wrong. The reason? Light wavelength expansion means the loss of energy. The total non-conservation of energy loss of all the light particles in the universe due to this imaginary process equals over 30 million times the mass of the universe. Galaxy motion is also soon to be magically affected somehow causing each galaxy to move away from every other galaxy as space itself expands, and in this way make it appear the universe is everywhere the same. But it's easy to show. It's the greatest scientific blunder of all time. All we have to do is examine what three of the greatest authorities on the Big Bang say when trying to convince their physics graduate students that it is genuine. Of all the disturbing implications of the expansion of the universe, none is more upsetting to many a student on first encounter than the nonsense of this idea. Expansion relative to what? Expansion relative to nonsense. Only later does he realize that the atom does not expand. The meter stick does not expand. The distance between sun and earth does not expand. Only distances between clusters of galaxies and greater distances are subject to the expansion. Only at this gigantic scale of averaging does the notion of homogeneity make sense. Not so at smaller distances. No model more quickly illustrates the actual situation than a rubber balloon with pennies affixed to it, each by a drop of glue. As the balloon is inflated, the pennies increase their separation one from another, but not a single one of them expands. Here is another illustration proving the same point. Namely, if expansion had ever existed, galaxies would have expanded into smithereens. Obviously, no galaxies would ever have formed in the first place. But as we saw earlier, the universe is full of them. More than a thousand billion trillion. Each one silently testifying that the space-time expansion hypothesis has always been an imaginary effect and hence that Big Bang has always been nothing more than a big fizzle, just the figment of the imagination of those who vainly tried to wipe the remembrance of God from His universe. While the Big Bang collapses under its own contradictions, we now begin to understand the true significance of Hubble's discovery. There really is a nearby center of the universe, and this cosmic center of the universe illustration shows how galaxies diminish in size and increase in redshift as they move further from the center. So what is the significance of the center? What does it all mean? In Isaiah 40, verse 21, the Bible speaks of God spreading out the heavens, an obvious reference to the expansion of the universe we've been discussing. Also obvious is that their outward motion, their spreading out, implies there is a point of origin, a definite location from which they are spreading out from. Which point could that be? In Psalm 103:19, the Bible says, Thy throne, O Lord, is established in the heavens, which we also identify with the location of the great white throne described in Revelation 20, verse 11. It's just that simple. To us, the logical conclusion is that God deliberately created the universe so as to reveal that His throne, the great command center of the universe, is located so astronomically nearby that it could be within our own Milky Way galaxy. On this basis, we here on planet Earth are definitely in a privileged position in the universe. It is reasonable that Earth should occupy a special place in the cosmos because the Creator Himself lived here for over 30 years. We thus believe God is now using the heavens to confront humanity with astronomical proof 
that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's fascinating to think about what we would find if we were to travel to the throne itself. So let's take a trip there right now through the magic of computer animation. And as we prepare to leave Earth's orbit, we see the night sky coming into view with its millions of city lights far below. The sun blazes into view along with the constellation of Orion, and we begin to accelerate passing our sun at 10 times the speed of light. Years ago, I suggested in a scientific publication that the Orion Nebula was the space corridor to the throne, and now as we approach the stars making up the constellation, each one a different distance from Earth, we're going over one million times the speed of light. As the stars of Orion pass behind us, the Orion Nebula, 1,500 light years away from Earth, looms larger and larger as we begin our deceleration. This nebula is a vast cloud of rarefied gases and dust 100 light years across. It is illuminated and being boiled away by this handful of very bright and very hot blue-white giant stars called the trapezium. Hundreds of smaller sun-like stars form a cluster around them. As we pass through the cloud, and emerge on the other side, we see heaven itself and the throne of God described in Revelation 21, 16 as being a glorious city, 350 miles square. Verses 19 and 20 tell us its foundation is made of 12 layers of precious gemstones and surrounded by a 250 foot high wall containing 12 gates, three on each side. As we enter through one of the huge pearl gates described in verse 21, we see within the city, on top of its huge mountain, spoken of in Isaiah 14:13 and Revelation 14:1, the indescribably glorious and holy throne room of God pictured in Revelation 4. We reverently enter and approach closer to his throne, and there before us, according to Hebrews 8, 1 through 6, and Revelation 11:19 is the same fourth commandment of the ten given to Moses on Mount Sinai, which tells us of God creating the visible universe in six days and resting on the seventh day Sabbath. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 18, that it has never been changed and that he is there now representing us before God. The fact that God created the universe to specially point to His throne and His seventh-day creation commandment tells us it is just as valid now as when given in Eden. It will be of spectacular importance as the end-time events continue to unfold before us. How could it be otherwise when we see the first angel of the three in Revelation 14 commanding with a loud voice in verses 6 and 7, for everyone to worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. We believe the timing of this discovery, that the universe really does have a nearby center, may mean God arranged all this to come to world attention before the greatest and most spectacular event of all time. The second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. As you can see, He is at the throne, ministering as our great high priest as described in the book of Hebrews but very soon He will return. Retracing our steps now, Jesus comes out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary on His way back to the earth. The angels surround him, forming a vast cloud like the one described in Acts 1 verse 9 that the disciples saw when Jesus was taken back to his throne at his ascension from earth 2,000 years ago. And just like Revelation 1 verse 7 says, as he enters the solar system, 
every person on Earth will be able to see him approach, at first like a dark storm cloud, growing larger and brighter, until, according to Revelation 6, verse 14, the atmosphere rips apart, and suddenly, there he is. His brightness, like pure energy, consumes all who turned against him and rebelled. Yet we who are waiting for him, will he save from that destruction? That's what it's all about. The Lord is trying to help us prepare for this great and glorious event. Lastly, believing as we do that God intends to use the great works of creation presented in this program, as well as the saga behind these discoveries, to awaken a great many to a sure realization that Christ's second coming is imminent, we urge one and all to join us in a worldwide effort to spread this good news so that we'll go as fire in the stubble. Thank you for watching, and may the God of creation bless you.